Welcome back to the channel. Welcome back to the channel. So, my 707 squad, Shamario Cristobal take a different approach in hiring, and my thoughts on potential candidate Marcus Arroyo, right? So, 707 squad, shout out Groove, shout out E-Black, shout out the whole Storm, Form, Storm Warning crew, right? I don't really know what their reasoning was for proposing the 707. I thought it was, I, I actually think it was a, a really, really good idea because my reason, my reason is simply this. A lot of times we get too caught up on guys that we missed or guys we didn't get or just, just upset about stuff. And we don't really stop and really appreciate the guys that we did get. Right, and I and I think and I think like you know Groove and they be like putting together uh, this seven on seventeen, you know, their seven on seventeen being an individual seven on seventeens. I thought that was really, really a good, good thing to do because it's going from two thousand and seven up until present time, right? And again, this is just a seven on seven format. It says this is not including what they would do on field. We're just speaking hypothetically, you know, shorts and 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 and, and t-shirts, right? You know. So, I thought it was a good a, a good noble gesture. I wasn't able to DM my particular team to Groove on Twitter for whatever for whatever particular reason, but I'll just tell you my team now. But for those who don't follow Groove on Twitter, uh this is this was the team he and he and A Black uh comprised of, right? So, this is offense. Offense, they had Brad at quarterback, Duke at wide, Duke at running back, Amon Richards, Philip Philip Dorsett, Stacy Coley, Allen Hearns, and KJ Osborne at receiver. Right, so that's their that's their offensive side. Defensive side, they had Jermaine Grace at the wheel, Sean Spence at the mic, Kenny Phillips at free, Cam Kitchens at strong. Corners, they had Artie Burns, Brandon Harris, and DVD. Right. That's a good squad. That's a good squad. It really is. And when you think back to the majority of these guys on this particular list, a lot these guys all made plays for the University of Miami, right? Now, we probably wish that they made some more plays that may have turned the tide on some games, but the majority of these guys came here, made plays, and obviously, of course, a lot of them didn't reach the potentials or the heights that we thought that they would reach. But nonetheless, I am thankful that all of them decided to choose the University of Miami um, to play. Obviously, K.J. Osborne was a transfer, but you're still a part of the family, right? So that's their squad. <clears throat> this is my squad. I didn't want to do any overlap because they had a had a guy that did send in a particular team. Well, i just read off his team, too. Uh, he had TVD at quarterback, Duke at running back. He had Rambo, Allen Hearns, Berrios, Hankerson, and Brevin Jordan. Uh, those were his receivers. On defense, uh, he had Denzel Perryman, Mike, Spence, Will. Cornerbacks were Ryan Hill, Corn Elder, Brandon Harris, Deion Bush, and Cam Kitchens. So that was his squad, right? So like I said, I didn't get to send my particular squad in. But I didn't want any, I didn't want any overlap on my particular squad, so I, I, so I chose guys that – uh, that they did not have at particular position, right? So, this is my squad. I got Kosey Perry at quarterback. For those, for anybody that knows me, I love Kosey. All right, I love his, his his talent, and I'm you know I was happy that he was able to land on his feet. So shout out to you, Kosey. Uh, running back, I got Joe Yearby. Now again, this is a seven on seven set, and we know joe yearby is about as slick and as swifty as any as any running back that has come through the university of miami since 2007 right so at wide receivers this is 707 so this is this is the approach that i took i got jaleel skinner david njoku travis benjamin rooster and i got jeff thomas i feel like i got a good variety of size and i got a <laughs> i most definitely got some speed uh, with Benjamin and uh, Thomas and then Rooster's not slow by any stretch of the imagination, right? So moving on, linebackers. Again, this is 7-on-7. Seven seven. I got Ray Ray Armstrong and I got James Williams. Again, guys that are that are big, that can move. I feel like that they wouldn't be out of place in a 7-on-7 seven seven setting. Now, 
Secondary, again, may not be as strong as what Groove and A Black put together for the simple fact, as I said, I didn't want to overlap, right? So at corner, I got Sam Shields. I got Corn Elder, and I got Avante Williams, right? We all know Avante possessed uh, the skill set to play corner, so that would be my nickel with Sam Shields and Corn Elder on the outside. At safety, I got Neon Bush and Rashawn Jenkins. Uh, those are my two. Those are my two safeties, right? And man, just thinking back to it, man, I'm reminiscing. We only got that combination of Rashawn and Deion Bush for for really one year. And that was spoke that was supposed to be the back end. Because remember, Deion Bush had that sports hernia, right? That one year. Right? Missed that year. Then the next year, Jenkins had the neck injury. And by that time, Deion Bush, you know, was off to the league when Jenkins came back for the 2016 season, right? So we really only got them for one year because as a freshman, Jenkins came on later, and then obviously freshman year, Deion Bush was dealing with uh, some shoulder injuries. I still remember that big hit that he made uh, at Florida State. And I want to say, man, they tried to get my man for targeting. Or man, it was either Florida State or Virginia Tech. Man, just thinking about that combination, man. <laughs> man. But – that's my 707 squad. I'll read it again. Just, you know, I'll read it again. Going through fast. Uh, Kosi, Yearby, Skinner, Njoku, Travis Benjamin, Rooster, Jeff Thomas, Ray Ray Armstrong, James Williams, Sam Shields, Corn Elder, Avante Williams, Deion Bush, and Rayshon Jenkins. Right. So that's my 707 squad. So hopefully, man, maybe some, some more people will get involved, man, and we can have some discussions about this type of stuff because I feel like that, Sometimes we need to sit back. We need to have discussions about our players, comparing our players to our to our players, especially in this particular era. From 07 to current time, I feel like it would be some great, great conversations to have, you know, about some of these particular guys and maybe, you know, what from a coaching standpoint that wasn't done or maybe from a player standpoint what, you know, maybe they didn't do, right? But anyway, that's that. So moving on, right? So Josh Gass is gone. Josh Gass is out the building. And it seems that Coach Mario is seemingly taking the same approach last year as he did, um, well, this year as he did last year. Now, I will say this. This is a particular different caveat, right? Because I will acknowledge this. Uh, Coach Cristobal was hired in December of last year, and he brought in Byron McClendon, obviously brought in Coach Joe, and we still had some staffers still left on staff. Now, obviously, we know McClendon left to go to – uh, the University of Georgia. So that probably threw somewhat of a wrench in maybe the, the the cycle, right? So to Mario's credit, I will say this. Maybe we could have gotten a different offensive coordinator had Brian McClendon not left. So I'm not going to say he may have panicked or what the situation may have been, but we ended up with, with Josh Gaddis as well as Frank Ponce. Now, Seeing as that Gaddis and Ponce are gone, you know, people with inside information are disclosing certain information. Obviously, during the season, it was already noted that there was a disconnect between the coaches. So if it's a disconnect between the coaches, you already know it's a disconnect with the players, right? So people are starting to say that. But now it's starting to get a little bit more interesting in terms of some of the things that we're hearing. So it, it begs the question, should Coach Mario take a different approach in this particular process? Now, I will say this, to his particular credit, um, similar to Manny, when the situation wasn't working year one, you know, you got away from it. But the difference between Mario and Manny, in my opinion, is simply this. Manny had never been a head coach before, so... Historically speaking, we understand defensive coordinators, they want that um, ball dominant, ball control, you know, high time of possession type offense to keep their defense fresh because that's the side of the ball that they want to look good. But when we look at it from a situation from Al Golden, right, even though Al Golden played tight end, Al Golden is not a defensive coordinator for Notre Dame, so we have to look at Al Golden as a defensive coordinator. Al Golden came in flat out and said, look, we want to outscore people, right? We want to outscore people. So, yeah, Jed Fish first, then James Coley came along, right? And that's kind of what we were doing in certain instances, right? We were going out there looking to outscore people. And in some games, we were successful. In other games, we weren't, right? No, nothing is perfect. So, Manny Diaz, 
actually may have took a somewhat of a Gary Patterson approach with the hiring of Rhett Lashley, in my opinion, now that I look back on it. Because initially when Rhett Lashley was hired, I looked at Rhett Lashley's offense from the standpoint of what we saw at Auburn. And even though a lot of people were so compelled with the passing game that was going on at SMU, I still said, look, they still had a, a, a running back. He scored 22 touchdowns. They ran the football, right? Passing may have been more of Sonny's MO, but that run game that they had, running back over, he may have had 1,500 yards rushing, 22 touchdowns. They putting the ball on the ground, right? And so that was my initial thought. I said, well, he's just hiring another guy that may be a little bit more, um, a little bit better than Dan Enos, right? So that was that. And obviously we understand what happened, what happened with Red Lashley and subsequently to Tyler Van Dyke. So Mario, on the other hand, we don't necessarily know. We may need to, We he, he may need to, change his particular approach, right? May need to venture into getting a guy that may be from a tree of a, of a person that is a little bit more tempo, a person that has a little bit more um, unique route tree and, and, and things of that particular nature. I mean, we don't necessarily know. Um, but I will say this. Um, Mario should just look at it from this vantage point. You're going to get him the offensive line. A versatile offensive line at that. It's versatile. It's versatile enough to line up and run power. It's versatile enough to, you know, to sit back and pass block. It's, it's versatile enough to do all those particular different things. But, again, whispers, you're a little micromanager on certain things. And that's why I continue to say less miles. Because people will say, well, Saban changed. Yeah. Saban changed. But certain coaches didn't change. <laughs> certain coaches didn't change. Les Miles is the biggest example of a coach that did not change. Jimbo Fisher, by all intents and purposes, did not change, does not want to change. Now, hiring a Bobby Petrino is simply, basically Bobby Petrino does the same thing Jimbo does. You just hired, your, you just hired a clone of you, Right? So maybe if you are to relinquish play calling duties and it kind of looks the same, then you got to say you got to scapegoat. But you hired a clone of what it is that you want to do. So we will see if indeed Coach Mario will change because there are successful coaches who did not change, who felt that, listen, I won this way, we're going to win again this way. So let's not be so um, – Feeling as if we're in the know to say, oh, yeah, well, Coach Martin's going to change. There's no way he's going to. There's no way he's not going to change. What do you mean? You got examples of guys that simply did not change, right? So I'll leave it up to y'all. Lastly, a thought on Marcus Arroyo, and I'm going to get out of here. Obviously, he's a name that's being thrown around. Most people were saying the minute that he was fired from UNLV, uh, he may have ascended into, I don't know, maybe top five, maybe even top three um, guys for consideration. Now, I will say this about Marcus Arroyo, and I think we as fans have to kind of take some of these things into consideration. I remember last year when we were looking for a head coach, and a lot of people saying, man, bring Luke Fickle in here, bring Luke Fickle in here. And, again, I wasn't opposed to it, even though I had my list of guys that, that I preferred. But, you know, you're not opposed to Luke Fickle, especially what he was able to do at the University of Cincinnati. Now, listening to more broadcasts talking about Luke Fickle, it basically said that Luke Fickle is a Midwest guy. He's not, he's not looking to leave that particular area. So it, doesn't, so it doesn't necessarily come as a surprise that he took the Wisconsin job. And it's kind of like this. Some guys are just comfortable in the areas that they're in. They don't want to up and move. You got some guys that'll go coast to coast, but you got some guys that like they like where they are. Um, the guy's name skips my mind. The, the real good coach at Boise State, right? That was that was a guy that many people talked about. That said, you know, he's he he's he likes that western type of thing. He's not necessarily trying to get over here and do all that stuff like that. And obviously he subsequently went to the University of Washington after he left Boise State. And so I think you have to think about that when we talk about Marcus Arroyo. 
is he a guy that would want to come over here or feel comfortable being over here, right? You know, you look at it, it says a job is a job, but there's there's some jobs open on the West Coast, right? So that's one thing. Second thing, um, and I'm not I'm not absolved from this because I have instances that I talk out of both sides of my mouth too, right? And what we have is that it was Oregon fans that came on our message board when Mario Cristobal was 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 hired, right? They said their piece, and we looked at it and said, "Oh, y'all just a bitter fans." And some, and there could have been some bitterness in some of them, but I think there was some truth in some of the stuff that some of them came on there and said, right? All of them didn't come on there. Matter of fact, none of them came on there disrespectful, honestly, except for maybe one or two. But when we were going through the midseason, we were talking about when we were really, really, really looking at it, saying, "Man, this Josh got it. This Josh got this guy. Man, this isn't like this is gonna work." And one of them came on there and said, look, this is what's going to happen. Y'all are going to blame the offensive coordinator and say it's the offensive coordinator's fault. Y'all are going to rinse and repeat the same thing. Because at the end of the day, this is Mario micromanaging. Now, of course, most of us will write that off because we'll say, look, you're just being a bitter duck fan. That's, that's all you're doing. You never won a national title. Uh, your two national championship appearances, you got beat. One of them, you got slaughtered by the by Ohio State. What are you talking about, right? And so I had to stop and I had to say, well, wait a minute, we did the same thing. As a matter of fact, I, I, at least from the vantage point of where I'm at, I led the charge. I went to Penn State message board and I laughed last year. I literally laughed at them talking about how great of a hire getting Manny Diaz was. I laughed because they took the liberty of comprising statistics from 2016 to 2018 when he was a defensive coordinator, which that's cool. That's cool. But it was still 19, 20, and 21 when a certain coach's talent was no longer the overwhelming majority on said roster. Right? Give it to Manny. He can coach the heck out of somebody else's players. No doubt. It's when his guys start entering the building that it becomes a problem. And most people brushed it off and said, oh, well, you know, he was a head coach. He can't, you know, juggle both duties. Nah, I don't want to hear that. I don't want to hear that. Because he was, it was recruiting misses before he even got the head job. It just all came to a head in 2019, 2020, and 2021. That's all it was. As Malcolm X said, that was just the chickens coming home to roost. That's all that was right there. But getting back to my point, I say to say this. There could be some truth in that. It could be some truth that he did micromanage Marcus Arroyo. And this is why I say this. Marcus Arroyo was hired by Uncle Willie. And if we know anything about Uncle Willie, we know the type of outfits, the what, lethal simplicity. <laughs> the lethal simplicity outfits, right? We know about that. But I have to say, if that's your outfits, if that's, if that's what you want as an offensive coordinator, why would you hire Marcus Arroyo? Unless his idea of outfits, unless his interview, think about this. His interview had to give you something to say, this is the guy that I feel like can run the offense that I want. Right? So obviously we know what happened with Willie. Willie left high tail into Florida State. Marcus Arroyo was held over as offensive coordinator for Mario Cristobal. And Justin Herbert had two good years, his junior year, as well as his um, you know, senior year and stuff like that. I think his sophomore year was all right. Some Doug fans said Marcus Arroyo didn't necessarily believe in Justin Herbert, so you take that for what it's worth. But we say that Marcus Arroyo will be a bad hire, and I'm maybe I'm maybe I'm just playing devil devil's advocate here, but I'm trying, but I'm just trying to say this: Willie Taggart's version of what offense is is not what Mario Cristobal's version of offense is, because Willie Taggart hired Kendall Bryles as his offensive coordinator at Florida State. So we look at Kendall Bryles in a certain, you know, 
echelon of offensive coordinator. He's not the best, but he's he's right there. He's not a guy that we feel like that we'll go into the game and we'll just be out schemed. Uh, the defense will fluster him. Right? We look at him in that particular realm. So I so I could just be off a little bit, but I think maybe. Marcus Arroyo kind of is in that particular vein of offensive coordinator, and he just wasn't able to do that because Mario Cristobal may have interjected himself a little bit too much in the offense. Because Oregon Duck fans could not wait for Joe Moorhead to leave. Now, again, this could just be Duck fans being um, living in the past, the Chip Kelly, uh, Mark Helfrich, Line up, run it, the uh, Michael James uh, games and stuff like that, the, the the Anthony Thomas, those type of things like that, just speed and just, you know, the jerseys, all that flair, all that stuff. Maybe they caught up in that, right? Maybe they need to come back to reality and say, no, no, this is how everybody else is running the offense. That right there, that was just a moment. Y'all never get back, even though they felt like they got a little bit of it back this past year with Bo Nix. But – that's, but I'm, I'm going to get out of here, but that's that's just my thing. I think that we have to look at it from this particular vantage point. Does the offense that Marcus Arroyo truly, truly want to run, is it more of Mario style or is it more of in the vein of what Willie Taggart wanted to, wanted to run when he got Kendall Browse to come in and run? Is it that style or is it more Mario style, right? And that's the way I have to look at it. And if Marcus Arroyo is hired, right, I'm not going to say it's a bad hire. I'm not going to jump out on the front porch like I did about the Josh Gaddis hire not being what many people thought it was. I might actually give him a chance because he's worked with Mario before. And I feel that if he would, and, and if he is hired, right, and this is just pure, pure speculation, but I just want to drive this for home. If he was to be hired, I would think that if indeed Mario does micro, is this in a micromanaging standpoint, I think I need that in writing that you're not going to micromanage me. You're going to let me run the offense that I want to run. If not, we don't have to continue this interview this interview any any longer, right? So that's the way I look at it, right? But as always, man, like, share, subscribe. And again, man, shout out Groove, shout out A Black, shout out Storm Warning. And... Like, share, subscribe, comment, and as always, it's all about the you.